Las Vegas has been home base for a bevy of famous magicians and illusionists from Siegfried and Roy to Mac King to Penn and Teller, with lots of appearances from the biggies like David Copperfield, Shin Lim, and even Chris Angel. Sure, why not? Chris Angel. But what's the magic scene really like here, and how do you even become a Vegas magician? Today on CityCast Las Vegas, we talk with professional magician and co-host of the comedy podcast, Hey Scoops, Matt Donnelly, about the magic scene in town, some hidden treasures, and where it's going. He'll also tell us what your card is. Spoiler, it's the Seven of Spades. It's Tuesday, January 9th. I'm David Figler, and here's what Las Vegas is talking about. Matt Donnelly, welcome to CityCast Las Vegas. Thank you. Thrilled to be here. Uh, big fan of the pod. Oh, I appreciate that and us of yours. Let's talk about the actual magic scene in Las Vegas. Uh, give us kind of an overview. Who are the big players and who are maybe some of the smaller players that people should know about but don't? Certainly the big players are Penn and Teller, Copperfield, and then you got like Matt Franco, Piff the Magic Dragon, Shin Lim, and Colin Cloud. Um, those are probably the biggest heavy hitters here on the strip. Colin is not one that I'm familiar with. Where does he play and what's his uh, big shtick? Colin's in Shin Lim's show. Oh, okay. So Shin Lim, Shin Lim has this thing where his fame outweighs his style of magic. You know, we talked about mm. like illusionists. Shin Lim is not an illusionist. He's like a sleight of hand artist. And so he's really good with cards and he is a celebrity. Like he is just a well-known and loved human being. And so when you go see him, if you're not familiar with him, you'd be surprised, but it is like going to see like someone seeing the Beatles at Shea Stadium. People wow. just scream for him. Uh, and uh, he became like a real heartthrob, both breaking out on Fool Us and then later on America's Got Talent, America's Got Talent Champions. And he's always been friends with Colin Cloud, who's a really fantastic mentalist. And so the show is actually a split between Shin and Colin um, over oh, there at the Mirage. Oh, at the Mirage. Great, great. And yeah. are, you think they're going to stay there in the transition time? Are they there forever? Are they the big headliner? I mean, they sell like crazy. So the the, the new people would be really st stupid not to keep them. So um, uh, I imagine they would stay there. But I don't know that intel. Who are maybe some of the smaller acts or the more obscure ones that people should know about? I mean, there's different ones that people might not have heard of, but they, they've been at it forever. Like Mike Hammer is particularly very funny. He, he works downtown. Uh, Murray Sawchuck's always popping up somewhere. He's a very funny magician as well. There's a giant, there's a, there's a bunny. There's a show where you find a, a, a guy walk around a giant bunny mask and you follow him back to a secret room where he does an amazing close-up show for like a, okay, a small amount of people. I like people. that. Where, yeah. where, where would you uh, encounter the, the bunny? It's literally called like the hidden magic show. Like you have to just, you have to, you have to find it. You have to find it online and you have to find him and you have to find the show. Following bunnies down holes doesn't always work out for people. I no. remember reading some classic novel about that. Yeah. Uh, everyone who, who leaves there drinks the bigger liquid and they come out gigantic after the show. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that makes it worth it. Yeah. What about you? What are your favorite magic shows in town? What, what's about them that makes it so good to you? Well, I mean, I am obviously a huge fan of Penn and Teller. I, full disclosure, I work for them, but I started not working for them. I started watching them and loving them and then begging to intern for them. And so I just think they actually have defined modern magic. They used to be like the rebels, the outsiders, and the guys who kind of did it. Now, because of the way the world has changed since they got popular, I don't think it's popular to try to be like, hey, I'm a magical person with special powers. I think it's more <laughs> smart to kind of say, hey, I'm doing impossible stuff and I'm not magical, so you tell me, right? And so I think they've defined a certain hip level of magic that's now become mainstream. Uh, and because of the show Penn & Teller Fool Us, they have to write a significant amount of new material every year. So even though they've been around for a long time, they change up their show more often than any other magic show in town. So I think Penn & Teller have a distinct advantage of being incredibly entertaining. Yeah, uh, that Fula show is great. I actually saw you on it as in the guise <laughs> of the mind noodler, one of yes, your characters. Yes. Uh, how, how was that experience? Well, in truth, I work on the show. So I, right. I write for the and show. And you pointed that out. I mean, you weren't trying to pull anything over. No, no, it. no. It's not, and, I, yeah. and I don't win. So it's not like I had any competitive <laughs> advantage. <laughs> um, so if anyone used their inside connections to lose on the game show, I don't know how smart they are. But uh, 
I, I basically started magic because of working on that show. I was originally a comedy writer for Penn and Teller. And mm -hmm. my strength in the writer's room was that I knew nothing about magic on different projects that we had, you know, a Discovery Channel show, a couple of documentaries and things like that. But then Foolish came around and I ended up getting an unfair education in magic. Uh, and I basically... Because you got to see everything. I mean, it's a game show that has gone on to many, many seasons now where amateur and professional magicians alike go and literally, as the namesake says, uh, try to fool Penn and Teller as to how they did the, 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 the joke or the, the magic act. Right. And while that actually started off as like a, a almost like sarcastic thing where, you know, talent shows were all the rage when reality shows were first booming in the early 2000s. And Penn and Teller artistically didn't feel like it was okay for them as magicians to tell dancers how to dance or singers how to sing. And so they, they basically said, well, we could basically have magicians come on and we can only tell them if they fooled us. That's the only input we want to give. Mm -hmm. And then someone heard that and said, that's actually a really good idea. And so that became the show. It's really just a way to showcase magicians of all types on television. We showcase about 60 to 80 magicians a, a season wow. uh, on that show. Yeah. So that that's one of your favorites. Um, you work for them. Just by name only, what's a maybe a second favorite? Piff the Magic Dragon. Oh, okay. You could say why, because he's so much fun. He's the funniest guy. He's the funny it's the funniest show. I mean, it is the magic is almost secondary. And that's the funniest part, is because if you know Piff, he works so hard on his magic, all he's thinking about is magic, and he really does impossible stuff, but because he's a giant dragon, no one cares. And so the show is almost like this meta experience of this dragon trying to prove to the audience that he is magical and the audience just won't give him that credit. And right. so it is almost like this, just this frustrated, hilarious, wise ass magic dragon busting the audience's chops for, for an hour and a half while doing impossible things they can't explain, but they don't even bother trying to. So I love that show. Yeah. Yeah. No, me too. And I used to see him back in the, uh, Rose Rabbit Lie days when he was just doing kind of close-up stuff in the little side rooms. So funny. Yeah. Well, let's go the other direction and spill some tea. Uh, what magic show is the worst in Las Vegas? And uh, follow-up, why is it Chris Angel? <laughs> I, would say, <laughs> I would say Chris Angel gets a bad rap, except that he is uh, kind of a terrible person. So I don't know how to defend it. Um he does work hard on very expensive illusions. And so if you are a, if you think he is an attractive person and some people do, you will, you will see it, him do impossible big illusions with fire and things like that. I know multiple neutral people that this is not people that, that had any bias going in who walked out on his show. Oh, not good. It, he got walked very out, famous. Not disappeared by him. Exactly. Yeah, he, got, okay. he got very famous. And so he still gets a lot of attention for that fame. And some people just, you know, a lot of times shows are just that. I just want to spend time with a famous person, whether they're reading the phone book or trying to do an actual sure, fact sure. or whatever. They're just like, can yeah. I be in the same room with a famous person? And so Chris Angel gets to do that. And so that's that's why he has his, his thing. But he he does not have the best reputation in the magic community or, or the best reputation for as a, as a show. And, you know, it's funny though, because, you know, no matter what, uh, he's the one that gets associated with a certain style or certain part of Las Vegas. He's been parodied in Vegas movies a couple times. Oh, I mean, his fame and his style are undeniable. And, and, you know, marketing is the number one thing here in this town and he has yeah. a market, you know, there's no yeah. denying it. The Vegas headliner thing. It's, it's a, it's an awesome goal because Vegas is the magic capital of the world. Uh, we showcase more ticketed magic here than anywhere else. Is that and, true? Really? Where where yeah. are other capitals of uh, magic? I, I mean, I appreciate Las Vegas is an international city in a lot of things. I'm not surprised yeah. magic too. But where what are who are our competitors? Uh, Madrid, Spain, uh, okay. is a very huge magic uh, magic destination. It's a guy named Juan Tamarez there, and there's a Tamarez School of Magic, and there's a kind of a Spanish style of magic, um, and so magicians uh, a lot of people all over the world go there to study and then you can see some of the best magic shows in the world in madrid as well as here yeah are, are people making money matt doing magic uh outside of the headliner gigs uh in las vegas yes there's a ton of corporate work private party work uh the the joke is always to call yourself a play thing for the rich right <laughs> i always joke that magic is the lobster tail of of the variety arts like, if you want to go to a restaurant that just serves lobster, you'll pay a lot of money for that lobster and say it's the best lobster you've ever had. But if right. you're at like a, a, a you know okay corral and it's lobster week, 
then maybe you're not saying it's the best lobster you've ever had. So when you throw magic kind of into this variety show environment, it can kind of get a little janky. But um, when you put magic on a pedestal and, and, and put a price on it, people tend to agree that it's worth the premium. We associate well-dressed uh, people with magic. And so if you're at a high-end party and there's someone going around doing magic, that's like a good thing that you would, you would provide for people. And so, um, no, there's so many ways from birthday parties, you know, all the way up to crazy high-end clients. Uh, there's a lot of ways to make money in magic outside of being a, a, a theatrical headliner. Hey there, CityCast Las Vegas listeners. You probably heard the announcement, but if you didn't, our beloved newsletter editor, Scott Dickensheets, is retiring. And that means his job is up for grabs. So before he gets out that door, I've grabbed my friend Scott Dickensheets to tell you why you should apply. Hey there, Scott. Hey, David. So, Scott, what do you love about this job? Well, I like being beloved by you, for one thing, David. Well, you know, that's part of the gig. <laughs> but also, I just like, you know, you get to write a lot in this job, you get to pursue your passions, and you force to form new ones because you have to write every day. And that's always a good thing for a writer, I think. Of course, you know, the downside of this job, I don't know, maybe the upside, is that you have to work with the likes of me. Is that a challenge, Scott Dickensheets? <laughs> <laughs> It's like a keto. You you push, I pull, I push, you pull. And in the end, it typifies what one thing is great about this job, which is plugging into the city cast hive mind yeah. and all the really intelligent, smart, funny, committed people that are around you in this job and make it much easier and more joyful to do. It really is a team energy and it's, I love it. Oh, every day crackles with it. It's It's really cool. So where can people apply for your soon-to-be old job? They can go to citycast.fm slash jobs. Okay, that's citycast.fm slash jobs. Slash jobs. And, yep. And don't forget, that deadline, it's January 14th. I want to talk about your podcast for a second, Matt and Mattingly's Ice Cream Social. You guys are both improv comedians you and 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 your partner paul yeah um and even your sound guy you're all super funny right well um, thank you well you are and but you're also you specifically are immersed in the world of magic and uh, i mentioned the mind noodler act which is hilarious right. but also interesting as as far as the illusions go how does comedy fit into the mix is it an easy fit are, are all the magicians trying to be funny now you, i think just like any form of comedy, there's a lot of versions of hack comedy. So when people think of comedy magic, most times people kind of roll their eyes, you know. But when you think of people like Amazing Jonathan right. or Pith and Magic Dragon. Amazing Jonathan. Uh, th yeah. Those kinds of people, then you realize what, what real funny is. And Penn and Teller, obviously, are, are very funny. Although I think they're more respected as intellectuals in the field than they are as comedians in the field. Mm. Um there is an interesting thing uh, that I've noticed because I came to Magic late. I started I started on a dare from Penn while working on Fool Us when I was 39 years old. And now I'm working all the time as a magician six years later. And it's been a really interesting journey because I've been studying it late in life and kind of coming to it late in life. And I've been doing comedy since I was 15. You know, there was Wayne Brady's show here at the Venetian. I was right. in that show as an improviser. I did a lot of improv back in New York. I've been doing comedy for a very long time. And yes, uh, it can help magic and, and can hurt it. So like basically you need magic to have this gigantic payoff at the end and laughter is kind of a release of, of tension. And so if you're making too many jokes while you're trying to do impossible things, then the audience can kind of miss or not give you credit for those impossible things. So sometimes for me, it's about learning to pump the brakes on the comedy while I finish out a trick. Uh, yeah. So the trick pays off. One of the things that I love about Penn and Teller show uh, over the years, and I've seen it many times, is on one hand, they're kind of like telling you the secrets of tricks, like pulling back the curtain and the artifice. But at yes. the same point, they're not, <laughs> you know? That's it's what they're like, really good at. I, yeah. I, I, I've tried it. I'm not smart enough to do it. It just doesn't work. And actually what happens is like a side effect of that is people thinking they can do what Penn and Teller do, and they just end up 
kind of sounding like a college lecture or something like that, where they're trying to like give away the tenets of magic in some kind of authoritative yes, welcome way. Welcome to my TED talk. And it's like, we yeah. wanted magic, you asshole. Penn and Teller always do it as a deliberate setup. It's almost uh, its own form of misdirection. They're never actually right? really trying to do it. And so I think because they do that, they have this reputation for being more honest than the average magician, but they're doing it as so much, so much more often as just a bait and switch tactic. So I, I, I think they've gotten away. It's, you probably point out the biggest thing they get away with uh, compared to other magicians. Yeah, I think Piff does a little bit of that too, especially with the incorporation of his dog doing tricks, <laughs> you know? Yes, that's always the funniest thing. I uh, When I was on Fool Us, Piff helped do the little opening video part of my appearance, you know? Yeah. And the producer of that segment was like, I was thinking the dog could do this. I think the dog was could do that. And Piff just laughed and said, do you see what the dog's doing right now? What that's what the dog head? does. <laughs> you're, seeing, <laughs> you're seeing the whole spectrum of ability right now. <laughs> Mr. Just being a just dog, just there. literally being a dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, yeah. all of his, all of his jokes imply Mr. Piffle is just sitting there while magical things happen around right. him. Right, right. Well, you know, in the spirit of um, talking about the, the maybe the hack magicians who are out there or people who are you know trying to swing way above their weight, uh, is is there maybe a a hackneyed often seen magic secret that you would reveal for us. It could be something fun to look at for when we see those bad magicians, or maybe you could even like reveal the goof of a magician you hate. You, it's That's dealer's choice, Matt. Give us something. T Teller, you know, does talk behind the scenes and he's a brilliant man. And so he yes, I've heard says, him on NPR and I've also yeah. heard him ranting at like county commission meetings about things, bad things in his neighborhood. So yes, I know he could talk. <laughs> he's very protective of his neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, he always says that magic. It's not that the secrets are important. It's that the secrets are ugly, right? Mm. If they were beautiful, we would show them all the time. Okay. Uh, and so if you ever see Penn and Teller's cups and balls, there's a, is a great example where they switch to clear plastic cups on, on the third phase of that routine. You can follow it if you want, because it's actually really beautiful to watch Teller quickly load and unload balls and baseballs in between those cups, right? Yeah. Um, and so I would say like the th the biggest pet peeve I have is just bad false personal stories, right? So like oh, when they if, give you, you, the if you have an illusion narrative. where you're going to make it snow in the theater, you know, you're going to make up some story about how snow was special to you or how you never saw it or you had seen it or you haven't seen it since blank. And you're just making up some really wishy-washy BS story about yourself that just can't be true. Or you have like very young performers who are into mentalism who are trying to tell you that they're experts in psychology and like body language and they're like, you know, 19 years old and you're like, you, you, yeah. you're, you're not. Live you're a little not. life, my friend. <laughs> and that's it. And I think that's the, the biggest thing, the biggest advantage that you that I have coming from comedy that you that you don't get coming to magic is in magic, you can get all these tricks and they just work. So you always get credit for the tricks working. And so you don't ever think to work on what you're lacking. And in comedy, you have to bring comedy that fits you or the audience hates you. And so you learn quickly what your type is before you can do anything. And I think that's where I had a huge advantage of coming to magic late is it was a, a very quick filter of what would and wouldn't work for me on stage. Now, what would you consider to be an amazing night of magic out in Las Vegas? So if somebody didn't want to just kind of sit in a showroom, but really kind of like get blown away or be in, involved on in some level with, with the magic acts, where would be their great night? Man, that's a tough call because I think that's exactly what Vegas is missing. Um, as I think, mm. like I, I think there are places where, you know, I think I think Vegas could use a place that has like a hidden bar that has really great strolling magicians, where you uh, don't have to find the bunny in the wild. Yeah, we don't have to find the bunny in the wild, right? You know, like um, one of the gigs I worked was at F One, where I worked with um, five other really great close up magicians from around the from around the country, and yeah. they just went around you know, person to person, just frying their brains. And I think that close up magic, I think is the most powerful magic. It's the hardest to market. It's the hardest to say you want to see, but when stuff really happens that close right in front of your face, I think it's undeniably amazing. All right. I'm going to give you a million dollar idea for free. Mm -hmm. um, get a group of your friends together who do this yeah. level of, of, of close up magic. Yeah. Uh, find a new marijuana lounge that's looking <laughs> for entertainment. Uh, you already got a low bar to blow people's well, minds. What's I was gonna say? I'll just say I did everything. I don't even have to do it. 
<laughs> That'd be great, though. I mean, I know about this place in L.A. that's legendary called the Magic Castle, and I know yeah. a lot of... I'm playing uh, there next work- week. Oh, awesome. I, I want to hear how it went. Um, I do hear a lot of Las Vegas magicians like aspire to get there or like that's a big kind of cred on their on their magic resume. Could something like that exist in Las Vegas? Or maybe the better question is why doesn't something like that exist in Las Vegas? Well, it doesn't exist right now because Las Vegas is a headliner town right now and mm. more than ever. Right. So now it's not even about headliners that will be here all the time. It's like headliners that will maybe come here for X amount of weekends and we take it. And like that's what's really the main driver uh, of of events right now in Las Vegas. I don't think people are landing going like, I wonder what shows at my casino. And that used to be a very common thing to do. Yeah. I think people are landing here because they're going to a particular tentpole event and then they might see something secondarily. So I think it would take a really hip casino that's really invested in their hospitality to make something like that happen. So with your million dollar idea, I need a million dollars as well. You know, Matt, you're kind of hinting that the the days of the big Vegas headliner for magic are maybe on the wane. Uh, what do you think might replace it in Las Vegas? I mean, I think you're going to see more like niche stuff where basically people are going to look, they're already coming here for a tentpole event, a specific concert, a specific sporting event. But I think mm-hmm. they're going to look for something that's more intimate, something that's more catered to them. So they can go home with like another story from Las Vegas. I think you're seeing it popular. There's like, you know, there's a couple of supper clubs that are popular over at the Wynn um, and over at the Bellagio. And I'll tell you, someone who's really doing, actually, who actually probably is already doing our million dollar idea, which is uh, Lost Spirits. Lost Spirits uh, oh, okay. over, at, over area, at Area 15. Yeah, over at Area 15. Uh, they basically, like a couple of circus shows closed and they basically picked up all the best circus performers from some shows that closed and they take a bunch of, um, you know, really great close-up magicians oh, and yeah. they put them all in one interactive experience that's the pseudo rum tasting kind of thing. And it's exactly, mm-hmm. exactly actually what we're talking about. And it's, it's, it's amazing. With the it magicians like fully yeah. in effect. Yeah. So you go to this, this, this off the strip location, it's kind of warehousey, it's kind of cool, it's amazing ambiance, you're kind of lost in time. And then you, you kind of stroll room to room and see all these amazing acts. So they actually are doing exactly what I should be doing. Well, that's awesome. And shout out to Joan Decor. Um, one of my, oh, she's great. Yeah. Friends who who's over there at Lost Spirits. And sometimes. Jacob Jacks as well as another magician over there. Okay. Yeah. Let's shut them all out. I mean, it's interesting how many sort of these uh, niche performers are all over our city in different guises. I mean, that's kind of one of the beauties of Las Vegas. A lot of people come here for a, maybe a big show or for a different reason and then land in these interesting little spots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Opium just closed. I'm sure those performers are now up for grabs as well. Those are some amazing acts that are now on the free market. All right, let's get them to the Marijuana Lounge stat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if the Mind Noodler was in the middle of it, it would be an instant hit. Um, Matt Donnelly, thank you so much for telling us about this magic scene in Las Vegas. I, I hope it grows in surprising ways. Of course. Thanks, man. Anytime. And that is all for today here on CityCast Las Vegas. If you enjoyed the show, hey, go tell a friend, rate our show, leave us a review. We really enjoy reading those reviews and subscribe to our amazing morning newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Till then, stay lucky.